This is Design 30. Welcome to the Design 30 podcast. My name is Jason Bilyeu, and in this podcast, we discuss uh, design strategies and tools to improve creativity, innovation, and overall design confidence. Today, we will be discussing mind maps. Uh, You may be wondering what a mind map is, and that's likely why you decided to play this episode. So we will discuss that in depth, and I will provide some um, ideas on how to get started with it, as well as some scientific backing and data to support using mind maps. But first to start, how does one map out and record what is in their mind? How do you create a visual representation of how you think? Is there a way to simulate your thoughts, write them down, and visually see connections that you may miss if those thoughts are only in your head. So a mind map is a type of spider diagram, uh, which you may be more familiar with, and they can be very useful for getting ideas or thoughts out of your head and onto a piece of paper, or even in a digital form, uh, doing it on your iPad, or even on an app, which I'll discuss later, uh, can be really useful. So how does a mind map work? Well, it's a pretty simple idea. Um, Essentially, you have a central topic or concept or problem, and you write that in the center of your paper. And then from there, you want to draw a circle or a box or something around that to contain it. And then you start branching off from there to different thoughts. Uh, So you branch off, write down your first thought, draw a circle around it, write down your second thought, draw a circle around it, so on and so forth. And then you go back to each one of those individual thoughts and you think through the different associated ideas or other concepts or topics that you associate with that thought. And you just slowly branch this out. Hence uh, the name, a mind map or a spider diagram. So for example, you could write cars at the center of your diagram. And then from cars, you would probably come up with uh, different brands such as Honda, Tesla, Toyota, Ford, Kia, Subaru, Chevy, um, all of the mainstream models. And then from there, you go and add all the different um, types of cars or trucks that each one of these companies produces. For example, on Honda, you'd probably write Ridgeline. Uh, I'd highly recommend that. Uh, I have a Ridgeline, full disclosure. And then on Tesla, you'd have the Model S. For Toyota, you'd have Camry, Tacoma, Tundra. On Ford, you'd have the F-150 which fun fact is the number one selling vehicle, I believe in the U S or close to it for the past like 30 years, which is a pretty crazy, uh, statistic I heard the other day. Um, but staying on focus, um, you'd have the Ford focus Ford fusion, uh, for Subaru, of course, you'd have your Outback, your Forester, Crosstrek. Uh, so this is a really simple model, but it kind of illustrates the idea Uh, of how a mind map works. You start a little bit more broad towards the center, and as you work your way out, you get more and more specific. Another example uh, would be, uh, let's say you're trying to decide what type of motor, you're designing a new car, and you wanna decide what type of motor you're going to use in this new vehicle. So you write motors at the center of your page, and then from there you start branching out. You'd probably have a gas motor, electric motor, uh, perhaps even a hydrogen fuel cell. And then from there, you get into a little bit more detail. Uh, for the electric, you would have uh, you know, some other associated thoughts. Well, what, what goes into, or what are the pros and cons potentially of an electric motor? Uh, well, they're low CO2 uh, emissions while they're running. Uh, there are new ideas, so there's always challenges. Well, not necessarily a new idea, but integrating them into vehicles is a new idea. 
And there's a lot of challenges associated with that. For example, the infrastructure throughout the country, um, it's not very well built up and it's expensive to install it. Then you look at hydrogen fuel cells. Okay, what are the pros and cons of those? Well, it's difficult to store hydrogen, especially on a vehicle. Uh, hydrogen is incredibly flammable. So what happens when they get into a car accident? Uh, they're also very expensive. And then looking at gas engines, they're fairly inexpensive, partly due to how common they are. They're really well known. They've been used for a long time. Uh, they are common and there's already a built-in infrastructure. Some of the cons would be they do produce uh, emissions as they drive and there are negative consequences associated with that. So here is just another simple example of how you're thinking through uh, a problem that you're trying to solve. You're trying to develop ideas, thinking through maybe pros and cons. Um, and it's a pretty helpful little tool that you can um, help get all of your ideas and thoughts out of your head and into a location where you can reference it later, look back at connections, things like that. So overall, what are the benefits of mind maps? Well, first of all, they help to improve your creativity and they allow you to organize your thoughts and they help you to visualize and understand the connections between your different thoughts. Additionally, they allow you to look for new connections. Uh, when all of these ideas are just floating around in your head, sometimes it's difficult to see how different thoughts or ideas are actually connected to each other or to look back on how you even arrived at a specific thought or idea and see how it maps back to the original concept. And then, in my opinion, the biggest advantage to a mind map is that you're getting ideas out of your head and onto a piece of paper where you can see them, look at them, you can edit things, uh, you can start over from maybe a thought that you had towards the end of your mind mapping and create a whole new mind map around that specific idea or concept. Uh, and really what a mind map is, it's a great example of divergent thinking. So divergent thinking as opposed to convergent thinking is a nonlinear, uh, spontaneous way of looking at problems or ideas. And you're not focused on accuracy. You're more focused on just generating lots of ideas. So this is divergent thinking would be brainstorming. Um, it's a very, ideally, it's a very creative process. And opposed to that is convergent thinking. And this is much more uh, focused on specific solutions. So you want speed and accuracy and you want logic when you're doing convergent thinking. The idea is to take in data and use that to determine a specific solution or a specific way to solve a problem. So divergent thinking as you're trying to expand ideas and you're not worried about accuracy, you're just trying to get ideas out there. And then convergent thinking, you're actually trying to come up with a very specific solution that's accurate and logical that's going to solve your problem. So what does the science actually say about mind maps? Is this just something that someone thought of in design school and thought it looked cool, it was interesting, artistic? Um, does it actually help you uh, remember ideas? Does it help you solve problems? Are you actually more creative if you use a mind map? And the, the results honestly are a bit mixed. Um, a mind map obviously isn't guaranteed to help everyone, uh, but there is some strong support for it. And so I've just pulled a few examples from some of the literature that I've been looking at and I want to read that for you just to help give you confidence that this is something worth trying. So the first paper is titled, A Brief Review on Developing Creative Thinking in Young Children by Mind Mapping. And this is by Wencheng Wang from the Department of Business Management at the, let's see if I can say this right, the Hua Sai Institute of Technology in Taiwan. 
And so they say, a mind map is a presentation form of radiant thinking, utilizing lines, colors, characters, numbers, symbols, images, pictures, or keywords to associate and integrate, visualize the learned concept and maximize brain potential. A mind map is a useful key adopting association skill and utilizing pictures to express the thoughts to maximize brain potential. It is a skill to develop the whole brain, applying characters, images, numbers, logics, rhythm, colors, and unique observation method, providing a limitless and free imaginary space to the brain. Briefly, mind map is a map for the brain. Application of mind map is to construct divergent thinking in the brain. While applying mind mapping, ability of logical analyzing and reasoning of left brain and creative thinking and memory of right brain can be maximized. Another study titled The Efficacy of the Mind Map Study Technique from this one is published in PubMed. Uh, the first author is Paul Ferrand. And the results of this study found that at, at one week, the factual knowledge in the mind map group was greater by 10%. However, motivation for the technique used motivation for the technique used was lower in the mind map group. If motivation could have been made equal in the groups, the improvement with the mind mapping would have been 15%. This study demonstrates that motivation plays a key role in how well you remember something. And this is pretty obvious. Um, as we've probably all experienced in school, when you really need to get a good grade on a test, uh, you're going to be highly more motivated and your odds of putting in more time and taking it more seriously are much higher. Um, but it does demonstrate that using this mind map technique, uh, was helpful for the, the group studied. The next paper is called concept mapping, mind mapping, and argument mapping. What are the differences and do they matter? The author is Martin Davies. So in this paper, there's a section titled Usability. And the author goes on to say, maps make new information more usable. Usable information can be more easily processed. This is why we draw maps in preference to providing long and detailed verbal directions. Learning simply by reading textbooks or listening to a presentation incorporating linear structured PowerPoint slides is far more likely to result in non-learning or rote learning. However, if students are asked to study or draw or manipulate a map of what they have learned, this may yield improved learning because it is more usable. This is because maps aid in linking new information with what they already know. And finally, uh, there's a paper that was looking at nursing students. And this is titled, The Effectiveness of Mind Mapping as an Active Learning Strategy Among Associate Degree Nursing Students by Anne-Marie Rossiano. In this paper, uh, in the results section, the author states, 90% of the students scored a four in the category of neatness and 93% agreed mind mapping enhanced their creativity. 97% of all students agreed that this learning strategy was effective and useful and provided the participants with a greater perspective about the concept of critical thinking. 97% of the participants related their mind map ideas to their role as a nurse. Analysis by results suggests that mind mapping is an effective learning strategy in the population studied. So overall, these papers do provide a lot of uh, confidence that mind mapping can be a helpful technique. Obviously, this depends on uh, what type of learner you are, how what your motivation level is when you're using it, and how seriously you take the strategy, which of course applies to every brainstorming tool that you're going to use. If you don't take it seriously, obviously it's not going to be that effective. So one app that I've used, uh, if you prefer using apps, is called Mindly, M-I-N-D-L-Y. So feel free to look that up and give it a shot uh, if you want to create your own mind maps. But honestly, there are a ton of apps out there. There's yeah, all sorts of different digital tools. I personally 
prefer just writing it down, sketching it out by hand. Uh, that's the best way for me to learn and be creative, but obviously you can use whatever technique works best for you. So before getting into our Design 30 Disciplines, there is one other thing I wanted to discuss somewhat on this topic. Um, last weekend, I was talking with a friend about mind maps, and they asked me, well, what is a mind map? And I thought through it, and I was like, well, essentially, you just have, like I described earlier in this podcast, your central idea, and then you have all these other ideas that branch off of it. And as I was describing that, I thought, man, this is really a pretty simple thing. Is it even worth doing a podcast episode on this? Is it even a worthwhile tool to use? And as I thought through that more, you don't need your tools to be complicated. And I think we often complicate things so much that we become less likely to actually do it. Uh, it can be way more intimidating if a design tool or method is very complicated and involves all of these different uh, layouts and graphs and charts and and interviews and and data sets where really something simple can be really useful perhaps because it is so simple and you're much more likely to actually use it although i was a bit torn on whether or not this was something worth discussing the more i thought about it, the more i realized that just because it's simple doesn't dismiss it as a helpful tool. And something I will discuss probably quite a bit more on this podcast is the difficulty behind simplicity. Uh, I often say simple is hard. And if you look at some of the designs of different products you have that you love, many of them are really simple. And sometimes you think, uh, you know, you look at that design, you think, duh, this is exactly how it should be done. This is how I would have done it. Anyone would have done it this way. But when you're trying to design something like that, you realize just how difficult that is. And getting to that duh moment takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of iterations. Uh, designing something complex is actually way easier most of the time than reducing that complexity down to something simple that actually solves or meets the user needs. So that's a little little bit of a dis, uh, an aside, but uh, it was something I thought applied to this design tool of mind maps. So now to end the episode, I will get to the design 30 discipline for the week. Uh, step one is to do your own research on mind maps. Uh, I'll have some links in the show notes <clears throat> for the studies that I discussed Um and there's just tons out there to read on mind maps. So just Google it and you'll find all sorts, way more articles than you care to read. The second thing would be to practice with some simple examples. So you can do the car example that I did earlier. You can do sports teams, shoes. Uh, I would suggest something simple um, and generic to start. And then you can start diving more into uh, specific design problems that you're working on. Which brings us to uh, the third discipline, which is to pick a design problem from your work or from your life and construct a mind map on it. And then I would suggest the next day, uh, try to reconstruct the mind map simply from your memory. And this is just to test how well the mind map actually helps you uh, recall information that you've written down. And then the last step, number five, compare the two maps that you made and see how similar they actually are. Did the mind map help you with your recall? Do you feel that it made you more creative? Is it helping you with your, uh, the organization of your thoughts? Was it easier to actually solve the problem with the mind map? And a lot of these questions might take you a long time to actually figure out, um, but at least this gives you a nice little way to start. And with that, we've come to the end of this episode where we discussed mind maps and I provided you with a brief explanation of what a mind map is and gave you some scientific backing that hopefully gives you a little bit more uh, confidence in the tool of a mind map and hopefully you'll give it a shot. 
Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, as always, you can find more from me on my Design 30 Substack. And please subscribe to that. It is free. It will say that there is a paid subscription and a free subscription. So if money is a, a problem, just sign up for free and and you'll keep in touch. Uh, well, essentially, you'll just get emails from me uh, each time I write a new article on there. And then please follow uh, the Design 30, well, Learn Design 30 Instagram. And you can also find me on uh, YouTube. Uh, that is also just called Design 30. And for all of those, it would be awesome if you subscribe and rate, especially on the podcast apps. If you can rate the podcast, that is super helpful for me. So with that, we will bring episode five to a close. Thanks for listening.